In this video, I'm going to tell you about the cheapest and easiest way to track inflammation in your body, specifically to track what's called chronic inflammation, one of the major causes of almost all the diseases of aging. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, like the video, and comment on the video to help the channel. Now let's get started. The reason I thought of making this video is that as some of you may know, most of the specific markers of chronic inflammation that you can get on your blood tests are a little bit expensive and a little bit out of the way to order. Sometimes your doctor or insurance will not cover those tests for you. But many people don't realize that in their regular metabolic panels, they have two items that if they create a ratio from the two of them, they can get a pretty reliable tracker of chronic inflammation. So in this video, I'm going to tell you all about that. And by the way, there's a blog post associated with this video because I have a lot of citations in the video and it would be a little bit arduous to uh, post them all individually in the video. So you can get a link to the blog post in the video description where the blog post is very uh, succinct and you can easily visit various papers that I've cited in the discussion today, which will be a short discussion. I'm also going to use the blog post as a guide for our discussion to keep this a little bit more visually entertaining. So here's the blog post. As you can see, it's called monitoring inflammation, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio which is also called for short the NLR. So this is a bit of an introduction here. What I'd like to tell you guys about before we get started, what is a neutrophil and what's a lymphocyte? Let's go to, uh, let's go to Wikipedia. A neutrophil and a lymphocyte are both kinds of white blood cells. But neutrophils, as you can see here, are the first responders of inflammatory cells to migrate toward the site of inflammation. Neutrophils are recruited to the site of injury within minutes following trauma and are the hallmark of acute inflammation. So neutrophils, and historically, by the way, neutrophils, the absolute number of neutrophils, also the, the percentage of neutrophils in your white, white blood cells, was considered a marker of inflammation on its own. Later, in uh, the early 2000s, they realized that if you divide the neutrophil by the lymphocyte number, either the ratio or the absolutes, you get a much more interesting uh, perspective of chronic inflammation as opposed to just acute inflammatory responses. So as you can see here, a lymphocyte is also a white blood cell. And there are certain kinds of lymphocytes. Uh, very interestingly, they include the natural killer cells, which are some of the most um, effective cells at uh, maintaining our immune system's uh, health and maintaining our integrity away from like uh, cancers, tumors, and stuff like that. So the way you can think of it really is like the neutrophils represent non-specific sort of inflammatory responses from your immune system. Whereas the lymphocytes represent very specific targeted responses either to bacterial or viral infections or to cancers, tumors within your cell for, and so on. So really it's a non-specific marker divided by a specific marker and that's the ratio we're looking at here. So where will you find the neutrophils and lymphocytes? Well in your regular metabolic panel that your doctor, your internal medicine doctor or family doctor orders for you, you'll usually find the absolute number of lymphocytes and the absolute number of neutrophils. All you have to do is divide the neutrophils by the lymphocytes and you're gonna get, gonna get a ratio. That's the ratio that we're looking at here. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna talk to you guys a bit about about how the NLR, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, associates with various diseases that we may endure, just so you guys realize how relevant that ratio is. Now this is not a, a comprehensive tour, it's a literature review with citations across uh, several pages which you can visit on my blog, but it's not very comprehensive, meaning there are other diseases, for example lupus, I didn't cover lupus in the autoimmune se section because not many people have lupus, but there's, there's way more than this obviously, but this is an interesting guide I think nonetheless. So as you can see, the NLR was first suggested as a marker of systemic inflammation and stress in 2001. An average NLR across people is 1.65, and that's quite low. You'll often find people that have tendencies toward inflammation be around 2 or 2.5, and you'll see people in acute states of inflammation be around 3.5, and it can be much higher also. But I would say that if you go, I was going to talk about this at the end, but if you have a ratio that's above the number 2, I would beware, maybe want to do a few more tests to find out why you have this kind of chronic inflammation going on. But more importantly, I would want to watch the change in the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio over time. That's the most important indicator rather than just the absolute number. So really a cross blood test you can mark across the year and see how your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio changes and that can be an interesting indication of how your health is doing across the year. In a recent study actually from 2021, it was shown that the NLR is associated with 
all-cause mortality in the general U.S. population. So it is a simple predictor of death, actually, from all-cause mortality. But it's also a predictor of mortality from heart disease, from cerebrovascular disease, where it's frequently studied, from lower respiratory disease, influenza, um, and kidney disease. Influenza and pneumonia, I think, as well. Now let's get, go through the associations of the NLR with various aspects of our health. Let's start with the brain first. In adolescence, elevated NLRs are found among children with ADHD, which is really interesting. It points toward an inflammatory uh, ideology of ADHD. Uh, adolescents with depressive disorder, major depressive disorder, also have elevated NLRs, even in children. And autistic children from autism spectrum disorder, what they call autism spectrum disorder, ASD now, also have elevated NLRs, and that's known. Aut autism in general has high inflammation. Now look at mental illness among adults. In major depressive disorder, uh, those with elevated NLRs are more likely to exhibit suicidal behavior, interestingly. Patients with bipolar disorder have higher NLRs than patients with major depressive disorder. And uh, by the way, I didn't cover this in this paper, but males in general have higher NLRs. And generally, the NLR is more predictive for male health than female health. Patients with schizophrenia have uh, elevated NLRs, and it associates with the severity of their symptoms as well. And interestingly, antipsychotic treatments, which is the standard treatment given to schizophrenics, lowers their NLRs, their inflammatory marker. Now, moving forward, in addiction, fascinatingly, methamphetamine abusers appear to have lower NLRs than the average population, indicating that something about that lifestyle using methamphetamine may be anti-inflammatory or may hamper lymphocytes. We're not completely sure yet. In neurodegenerative disease and multiple sclerosis, NLR elevation is associated with the level of neurological disability and the level of disease activity because people sometimes in multiple sclerosis get attacks of the disease and then it wanes for a while. When it attacks, the NLR will elevate also. Interestingly also, in multiple sclerosis, HIT cardio lowers the NLR via hormetic mechanism. What does that mean? That means that when you do HIT cardio, you cause inflammation in the body. As a response, your body sort of becomes more efficient at dealing with inflammation and then your level of chronic inflammation in this case uh, in multiple sclerosis actually drops this is a, a called a hormetic effect something that is slightly damaging in the short term but produces a net benefit for the person now in terms of the main neurodegenerative diseases and by the way i wanted to find evidence of the nlr use in huntington's disease which is a neurodegenerative disease very much marked by its level of inflammation i was unable to find any papers on on huntington's unfortunately or on als actually i don't know if i looked at als to be honest um, there may be papers on als but anyway what's interesting is this in alzheimer's disease nlrs are not usually elevated compared to controls but in Parkinson's disease, it is elevated compared to controls and much more so than in Alzheimer's disease. Also, in general, in the elderly, cognitive impairment associates well, cognitive impairment meaning like sort of dementia, uh, losing uh, mental acuity with age, it associates well with NLR also. Now, the next subject is autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases obviously are the diseases most marked by chronic inflammation. They're diseases in which the immune system begins to be pathological toward the host, the persons uh, who the immune system belongs to. So looking at uh, a meta-analysis on inflammatory bowel diseases, we find some interesting, and by the way, for those that don't know, I have an inflammatory bowel disease myself, which is Crohn's disease, the most major one. It also associated with C-reactive protein, which for those that don't know, C-reactive protein is also a measure of chronic inflammation. It's a protein produced by the liver and a very, uh, uh, accurate and helpful marker of chronic inflammation. It also associates with melondaldehyde. I have no idea how to pronounce this, but I actually order this test for myself all the time. Melondaldehyde is a marker of oxidative stress in the body as well. And then in Crohn's disease, it, it also associates with total white blood cell count, which by the way is also a marker of inflammation. In ulcerative colitis, which is another form of inflammatory bowel disease, similar associations were found with the additional association between fecal lactoferrin and fecal calprotectin. These are two fecal tests that are uh, standard tests done in uh, Crohn's disease and colitis. Interestingly, this is true unless patients in uh, colitis took an anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha drug, which is the main drug used to treat these very serious bowel diseases. It blocks the activity of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a member of the immune system. When it does so, it seems to break the association between the NLR and these other biomarkers markers in inflammatory bowel disease. Elevated NLRs are also associated with both of the major forms of uh, thyroid autoimmune disease, that is Graves' disease, as well as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
It's also associated with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, though it does not associate closely with disease activity, unlike in some of the other diseases we're looking at. It's a predictor of severity of knee osteoarthritis. IgA nephropathy, by the way, is an autoimmune kidney disease. Elevated NLRs are associated with poor outcomes there. And in psoriasis, which uh, many people have, actually I have psoriasis, a lot of people who have autoimmune diseases will sometimes have another one as well, so some kind of skin thing or something. Uh, Kim Kardashian is famous for having psoriasis. Interestingly, listen to this, people with psoriasis have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, because I, for those that don't know, cardiovascular disease, especially atherosclerosis, the development of plaque in the arteries, seems to be due to a couple of things. One of them is having a lot of LDL particles in the bloodstream, or a certain nature of LDL particles, and the second is inflammation in the bloodstream. So, so having a, a chronic inflammation predisposes you to plaque development. So here we, uh, it says, people, or I wrote, people with psoriasis have increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The NLR is a proxy for subclinical atherosclerosis among patients with psoriasis. Fascinating. Now moving quick, uh, I'm not going to be so detailed with the rest of it. We'll, we'll skip around a little bit so that we don't take too much time. I don't want this to be too long-winded for you guys. You guys can visit the, the blog post and see um, the details there. But it also associates with heart failure. So it's specifically, it's inversely, the NLR is inversely associated with left ventricular ejection fraction among people with heart failure. It also can predict heart failure using a cutoff of 3.0 with quite a bit of sensitivity and specificity. It could predict death. Uh, during a follow-up after uh, an event with again a lot of specificity uh, if the cutoff was used at uh, 5.1 which is a higher cutoff by the way the PLR is another uh, ratio I just uh, noted the PLR and some of these points here for my sake I'm gonna make a different video on the PLR ratio later or the PL ratio later in stroke elevated basal uh, NLRs are associated with worse outcomes and they also can predict hemorrhagic transformations from uh, cerebral infarctions, which means uh, profuse bleeding in the brain, which can be deadly. Uh, in calcific aortic valve disease, which is a calcification of the aortic valve, it is also predictive. Um, and it, depending on the kind of calcific aortic valve disease, so there's a BAV patients and TAV patients, the TAV ones had higher NLRs and lower CRPs than the BAV ones. Now look at atherosclerosis, which is the development of plaque in the arteries. Among the morbidly obese, the NLR is associated with the development of atherosclerosis. Among the elderly, the NLR predicts corroded artery plaques better than C-reactive protein or fib fibrinogen. Which is shocking, by the way, because I've heard lipidologists say that their primary markers of, of inflammation in the cardiovascular system is fibrinogen or is uh, LPPLA2. Very rarely do they mention the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. I mean, it's a really underused ratio, even by experts in the field. And certain kinds of uh, atrial fibrillation are also associated with high elevated NLRs with a cutoff of 2.1 being predictive, which is quite a low cutoff of the ratio. Now we move into cancers. I'm not going to get too much into cancers because to be honest, I didn't even review this very comprehensively because there are so many, especially solid tumor cancers that associate extremely well with the NLR. So, so there's just a, a tremendous amount of evidence of it. I went into a little bit of detail here about liver cancer because it interests me in particular and thyroid cancer. Um, but in general, solid tu uh, kind of tumor cancers are very much associated with NLRs and I would uh, highly recommend you guys check out the systematic review of studies with cancer patients. That's the point one over here. Now in metabolic diseases, including diabetes and metabolic syndrome, which as you guys know produces fatty liver disease and so on, there's an association between cardiovascular health in type 1 diabetes and the NLR. The NLR is uh, uh, elevated in pre-diabetic and diabetic patients but not in uh, late stage diabetes. Interestingly, again, we see the combination of physical activity, or well, not again, but it, uh, we see this mention of physical activity. So the combination of physical activity and a lower NLR produces a synergistic effect on quality of life in uh, type two diabetes patients. It's also a predictor of atrial fibrillation, uh, which is a kind of arrhythmia among diabetics as well. Fascinatingly, in fatty liver disease, elevated NLRs predict steatosis, which is the next stage of the disease called the uh, NASH inflammation of the liver. And also the, it predicts fibrosis, which is actually cirrhosis, the development of fibrotic tissue, uh, which means scar tissue in the liver. When the liver becomes all scarred up and has a lot of fibrous tissue on it, it's called a cirrhotic liver. Thank you guys so much for bearing with me. I know this is a bit long-winded. I'm about to finish. I just wanted to mention in kidney health, diabetic nephropathy, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, 
you find associations between C-reactive protein and inflammation and the NLR as well as you can find that in chronic kidney disease the NLR elevated NLRs can predict cardiovascular events and in diabetic nephropathy it predicts the worsening of renal function as you guys can imagine chronic inflammation is one of the main causes of deterioration of kidneys over time which don't heal very well you know and which respond very poorly to oxidative stress it also predicts the success of organ transplantation, heart transplantation, liver transplantation. Probably does two for kidney transplantation. I didn't want to be too comprehensive here. Finally, as you guys can imagine, of course, in the states of viruses and bacteria, the NLR is also elevated. So in, uh, with COVID, for example, it's a predictor of mortality. Um, it's associated uh, with hepatitis C. And it predicts at higher levels uh, bacterial infections including H. pylori or the resulting gastritis from H. pylori. Finally, a couple of other interesting things. The NLR has also been associated with severe tinnitus. Uh, tinnitus is a ringing in the ear that often comes from either inflammation or sudden uh, very loud noises. A lot of subscribers to the channel actually have tinnitus. And I, I was really surprised to know that it's associated with it even after the initial uh, injury. So that means that people with tinnitus must have some kind of chronic inflammation long term. And finally, it's also associated with mortality, obviously, among critically ill patients. So what's the long and short of it all? Well, first of all, chronic inflammation is a cause of all the diseases of aging. And so it is uh, a, a causal factor in almost everything that we have to be worried about in terms of our health. Second, we can monitor chronic inflammation very easily, both with specific tests that you may not be able to order affordably or with the permission of your doctor, but even easier with just a ratio that you can make of any blood test you have from your standard metabolic panel, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Third, you can manipulate chronic inflammation, you can alter it, you can improve it, you can reduce your chronic inflammation through lifestyle changes, through uh, changes in your eating patterns, through medications, and therefore it is something you want to watch because you can do something about it and it is informative. Anyway guys, thank you so much for bearing with me. I'm sorry for being long-winded. I hope this was helpful for you. Please tell your friends about this ratio. Please tell other coaches about this ratio, for example, in bodybuilding and powerlifting and strongman. I've never encountered anybody who used this ratio before except myself and it is very informative and very valuable and very easy to use all right guys thank you so much for bearing with me i'll see you next time